Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today's episode, we have Renaud Purifoy. He is a therapist and a speaker, author, teacher. He's done it all. And um, he's going to be on the show today to talk to us about anxiety. It's something that I know a lot of people suffer from, especially in these days and times. So I thought it would be a good topic for us. So if you'd like to follow me, I am on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all under the Conversations podcast title. I'd love for you to leave me a review um, on Apple if you listen through Apple Podcasts or if you're on Spotify, just leave me five stars. That would be greatly appreciated. Anyway, I'm super anxious for you to hear this episode. He really has a lot of tidbits of how to cope in these days, and I think you're going to like it. So here we go. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. Welcome and thanks for being on my show. Yeah. Where where are you located? Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. Okay. That's right. What about you? I'm in Sacramento, California. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know why I was thinking it was an hour instead of two hours, but anyway, here we are. What is your background for your name? Is that French? Uh, the, The first name is French. It was the last name of a friend of my father's that got killed in World War II. So, my brother is Andrew Jackson okay. Purefoy the third. They decide let's do something different with this one. I love so, it. Yeah, it's it's a really cool name. It's like uh, you you had to become something famous. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if you ever watched the old uh, classic movie Casablanca, the uh, inspectors and Inspector Renault. So it's uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a really cool name. Um, yep. How long do you live in California? Uh, most of my life, uh, I was born, my dad was in the Navy, so I was born down in uh, San Diego and then, uh, spent two years in Japan. Uh, when I graduated, uh, I was one of the baby boomers and weren't a whole lot of teaching jobs. So decided to go overseas. So my wife and I spent two years there and then came back, had kids and you know, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. How many kids do you have? Uh, two, one's in Texas and one's local. Okay. And grandkids? <laughs> Uh, I, I've got the three and then the one great granddaughter. We watch her on Mondays and Tuesdays. Oh, she's, isn't that so special? Yeah, it's she's, so nice. She's two and a half can... right now. So such a fun age, lots of energy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Renault, I wanted to have you on because you talk about multiple different subjects that I would love to touch on all of them. But for today, we're going to focus on anxiety. I know a lot of people that suffer from it. And I just think it's a really important topic to get out there. Um, Is that for some reason, it seems it's so prevalent now. Does it seem that way to you? Or has it always been around? Well, I I worked with panic disorder. And that's been around, you know, since cavemen. the overall level of anxiety, I think, is increased. Part of that's because of COVID. Uh, part of that's because of just, uh, especially in the younger generation, with uh, the rise of uh, social media. In fact, they have something called fear of missing out. Uh, that's very common in uh, younger people. You know, they see all these curated images of people having a wonderful time and beautiful lives and doing exciting things. And so they fear that they're missing out somehow even though all these images are not real images, <laughs> you know, they're, they're ones that have been carefully selected. Of course. Yeah. And I wondered that too, if social yeah. media really did play a part because when you, well, personally for myself speaking, um, I love to be around people, but sometimes it's nice to miss out. <laughs> well, I don't yes. have that FOMO feeling all the time now at the age that I'm at. Sometimes it's like, nah, I'll, I'll stay in for this one. <laughs> And and people aren't as grounded as they used to be. Um, Psychology kind of started right around uh, the beginning of around 2000, this century. And uh, three key things for happiness are number one, relationships and uh, having positive relationships in your life. And, you know, especially the younger generation, they don't have any idea what a healthy relationship is and how to have a long term healthy relationship. Uh, second one is purpose, and third one is meaning, and those two kind of overlap. But uh, you know, the, the 
people are sadly lacking and they fill their lives with entertainment and excitement or pursuing, you know, um, pleasure or success or money or whatever. And uh, some of the really core things that get you grounded and make you happy in life, they're missing. Do you think it's because they are in their phones or playing video games and stuff all the time, just con constantly diverting their attention from what's actually happening? That's part of it. I mean, there's been a real secularization. So, you know, we don't think too much about those spiritual existential things that are important um, and just being busy when you're busy all the time. Uh, you don't have time to really think, you know, people nowadays don't have quiet time. They don't have time to reflect on their lives, reflect on the meaning of things. Um, they're just busy plunging from one activity to another. And if you're constantly filling your head with uh, things like, so, like, like for my anxiety clients, we were telling them a long time ago is quit watching television, you know, as far as uh, uh, television news. And oh, yeah. Nowadays, if you're constantly uh, locked into a left wing or right wing, you know, talk show or host or news network, you're just constantly being inflamed with all these crises. Everything's a crisis when in actuality, it's not a crisis. Um, so, you know, that, that all contributes to it. Yeah, I, I remember having a conversation with my mom, oh, probably like a year and a half ago. It was when um, a lot of really negative things. I mean, there's always negative things on the news, but it was a lot of rioting and police officers being killed yeah. and random people that getting killed in the streets that shouldn't have been. And, um, you know, we were talking cause my daughter was really affected by it. And my mom said, this has been going on for generations. Oh, this yeah. isn't new. She said, I remember when I was young and she told some stories and I thought, I think that kids think that this is this is the only time that this has ever happened or people don't realize history is repeating itself all the time that we've all all the generations have been through a lot yeah. of negative things. Yeah, for most people, history starts from when they were in high school. <laughs> right. Every, everything. And, and again, our educational system doesn't really educate people very well anymore either. So people don't know about history. So. Yeah, I, I'm a child of the 60s, and of course, 60s was a very turbulent time. You had the Watts riot stuff going on, and, you know, this is just a, and, and if you go back and historically, that stuff has happened before. Uh, some of this, and, and the news media, they distort things. They don't really give you news. They give you something that is exciting. Uh, I mean, we, we talk about one or two people being killed, you know, by police. We don't talk about the thousands of people being killed each year in New York and Chicago. Uh, so, so things like that, you know, yeah. it's, you get a very skewed view as, as to what reality is. So um, you have authored a number of books and you've mm -hmm. been a therapist and a teacher. Um, what, what has been your favorite of the things that you've done so far? Oh, what I'm doing currently. <laughs> what do you do? I just, just finished a book on uh, why you feel the way you do. And uh, it, it was a really fun research uh, project. So I, I got into what's called affective neuroscience. And that's where they're looking at the emotional circuits in the brain that we share with other animals. In uh, the last century, all of your neuroscience was pretty much cognitive neuroscience. There's a little bit of affective research going on, but people were interested in like how vision, uh, hearing, you know, mental processes of, of that nature. And a guy named Pangsep, uh, kind of after it, right, right at the end of the uh, 2000s, uh, into the 20, you know, into our current century, and uh, he started working with animals and uh, has done just some really classic work as to uh, all the things that we share with them. And of course, a lot of your cognitive neuro neurobiologists they would say, well, you know, animals don't have emotions; it's all just you know conditioned stuff. And anybody who was a pet owner knew that that was not true. They knew their pet had emotions just like they had. In fact, sometimes they're even simpler to read than we are. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. I think yeah. my dog has feelings. I tell my husband that all the time. <laughs> well, well, they do. They, they have the same emotional circuits that we do. For example, there's one that, that I found really fascinating called the seeking circuit. And in mammals, it causes the babies to go out and just explore their environment. You can see that in human children. The first thing they want to do is as soon as they can move is they want to go touch everything and you know look at everything. And that's part of that seeking circuit that helps mammals find uh, resources in their environment. And uh, 
still active in us as adults, you know, when you go into a new room or a new place, the first thing you do is you look around and check everything out. And it causes us, to want, causes us to want to learn things, to explore, and to just to novel things fascinate us. So, yeah, it's just, and it's just like hunger or thirst. It's, some, it's a drive inside of ourselves that pushes us to go out and look at things. Yeah, I feel like the younger generation, they, uh, they enjoy it more. They pay attention more. They see the newness in everything. Whereas mm -hmm. as it feels like the older you get, you kind of start to censor it out. You don't take it all in like you should. Well, you have experience. And so, you know, a rattle that is fascinating to a little baby, to you, well, it's just a rattle, right? <laughs> Right, right. So they're, they're they're busy taking everything in new, and yeah, it's all brand new. And, and now as an adult, uh, a lot of this stuff is predictable. I've had experience with a lot of it. And so I, I still seek novel experiences, but, uh, you know, they're, they're just, uh, it's of a different quality. Right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, going back to anxiety, can we talk about that? Like, what is anxiety for people? Well, anxiety uh, is basically a response to threat, and we have two ways we respond to threat. One is anger, one is fear. And when I use the words anger and fear, I'm using them in a very broad sense. So anger can range from just uh, irritation to rage. Anxiety can uh, range from just uh, apprehension to panic. And so whenever we feel threatened, that's one of those circuits in the brain we're going to react either with fear or anger, uh, depending upon how we assess the threat. And a lot of that's done at an unconscious level. As you uh, grow up, uh, your subconscious just starts to make thousands of associations with what's safe, what's not safe, what's good, what's bad, what satisfies a need, what does not satisfy a need. And that unconscious part of your brain is always kind of assessing what's going on around you in terms of those associations. And so if you, if an association clicks that there's danger out there, again, depending upon how you've learned to react to it, you will either experience anger or fear. And again, you're, how you're responding, and that's part, a matter of training. And we learn how to respond partly by our experiences as a child and partly by the modeling that we uh, are copying and uh, our interactions you know, with others around us. For example, one of those circuits uh, in the brain is something called a play circuit. And uh, all mammals, you know, children love to play. And that's part of how you learn social limits. With my uh, two and a half year old uh, great granddaughter, it's, it's fun watching her out interacting with other kids as they play and as they just learn how to s interact socially, what's okay, what's not okay. In fact, I was watching a video of this uh, gorilla with a little baby gorilla was poking the old silverback and poking him and poking him and finding the <laughs> silverback. Turned around and said, you know, enough of this, go away. <laughs> <laughs> and so the baby learned some inter had an association. Of, this was not stuff that you do with a, with a silver bug, right? <laughs> and, and the same things occur with us as kids, you know. And we learn what we can do, what we can't get away with, what's safe with mom, what's not safe with her, what, what's okay with dad, what's not okay with him, what we can do at school, what we can get away with, you know, go to grandparents' house, everything's okay, you know, that type of stuff. Uh, and those associations, you know, we, we bring into adulthood. Uh, it's one of the big realizations early on for me was that adults are just big kids. You know, they're, they're walking around with uh, core beliefs and associations that a little kid came up with. And when you think of them in those terms, you understand why there's all crazy stuff in the world. Gosh, that's so true. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is when you think about that, that it's just something that you've just carried through all your life, thinking that it's accurate instead of just a belief. And you can change all that stuff. It's just that most people never do. If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. It has everything you need all in one place. So Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Makes it super simple. When you're hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and others. And it has everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. And best of all, it's totally free. So download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. So, so what's the difference between um, just having normal day-to-day -day anxiety or having an anxiety disorder? 
It has to do with how much it's disrupting your life. If you're not able to do normal functions or things that you want to do because of your anxiety, then that's a problem. And depending on how restricted it you are, that we now start to classify that as one of the anxiety disorders. Again, panic disorder is one of the big ones. Uh, that's where people are having panic attacks, and th so they start avoiding things because of those panic attacks. Then there's something called generalized anxiety disorder, and these are the... Uh, People that are the, the world-class warriors, they worry about everything. And, you know, just no matter what's going on, they worry about it. And, of course, if they're involved with social media and news, you know, and talk shows and stuff, that just gives them a lot more stuff to worry about. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, they become a professional worrier. Yeah. Um, so I know I have struggled with having the right words to say, you know, just like when somebody passes, you don't want to say the wrong thing or, you know, like what is a, what is a good way to respond to somebody that to me might seem like their thoughts are irrational and they've got it built up in their head, completely distorted, but to them it is a hundred percent real and they're freaking out. Well, you just hit me with two different things. With somebody, if you're dealing like with death where somebody has passed, you know, one of the big things that you find is people will say really stupid stuff. And yeah. the reason they do that is because they're uncomfortable with death. If you're okay with death yourself, then, you know, that doesn't bother you. And you don't have to erase those emotions in the other person. Because that's what's going on. People will come, they'll try to fix them up, give them some little... A witty saying or some little, you know, bright side thing, because they don't want to experience those negative feelings. And with somebody who's experienced a loss, regardless of what it is, really, the key thing is you just got to be there and listen to them. They just need to tell the story until they're done telling the story and, and ready to move on. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to really fix them. And so if you let go of that need to fix them and you're just there to be with them and just to listen and let them tell, you know, what they need to tell then that's really all you do. Uh, now, as far as people with irrational beliefs uh, <laughs> of other types, uh, that's a really broad question. We have to narrow it down to you know some, some specific examples. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about the whole idea of conflict. Uh, you know, when two people are together, they have conflict, right? I want to go have Chinese food. You want to go have Mexican food or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. So we, have, so we have a conflict. And the same thing with people with irrational beliefs. They have one view of the world, and I have a different view of the world. Uh, so how do we get along and resolve that? I, it, I think part of it depends upon the level of the conflict and who you're dealing with. Um, when I, my mom, uh, back before she was passed passed away, back when she was in her 90s, uh, you know, and even before that, you know, she had certain ways of thinking and doing stuff. And... Uh, a lot of it was not in my, not the way I look at stuff, right? Right. The discomfort was very minimal for me, and the relationship was important. So I would just change the subject. I wouldn't really confront her or try to change her thinking. Just, you know, she's going to be who she is. And so in that type of a situation, you know, um, like I said, you just you just basically go on the low end, and, and, and I'm going to just not take care of my needs. I'll just can basically consider her and take care of her because I value that relationship and I want, to, I want it to continue. And there's other ways I could, you know, move the conversation to where it didn't really bother me. Now, if I'm in a relationship with somebody who is a very rigid thinker and they're a non-negotiator, they're not going to, they don't want to listen to anything else. Uh, they don't want to, you know, it's my way or the highway. Then you've got a couple choices you got to make. Number one, if I if the relationship is important enough to me and the discomfort is low enough, then I need to just accept that that's the way it is. If not, then I need to either set some limits or leave. And that's typically what happens in a relationship like that. Yeah. That's hard for a lot of people to do to yeah. say no, or just not, not uh, engage. And, and part of the, part of the problem I think is sometimes people think I can change them. Yeah. You know, I saw a comedian a long time ago and it's always stuck with me. He talks about, uh, you know, some guys going to a, you know, a bar, a singles bar, and they're just looking around. And, oh, yep, no, yep, no, yep, no. And uh, some women walk into the bar and they look around. Well, now there's a nice fixer upper, you know. <laughs> uh, it's a little bit of a stereotype, but there's some truth in it, you know. Uh, and, and sometimes people really think they can fix another person and they can't, you know, the person needs to want to change. They need to be able to see the change. 
uh, and very rigid people, unless they run into some kind of a negative consequence, usually they don't want to change. You, you get that in abusive relationships, uh, where a person has been is abusive. Number one, they usually say, I can't help myself. You know, this is just the way I am, which is not true because they do control themselves when they're at work, when they're at the, you know, in front of a judge or police officer or whatever. They just, you know, they get wild only in situations where there's not, there's minimal consequences, right? Yeah. Of course, the second thing they believe is that, um, that they minimize the, what their actions. Well, it wasn't that big a deal. So I yelled and so, the, so, the, so they cried a little bit. So this happened, you know, and they minimize it. And oftentimes they don't really challenge those ero erroneous beliefs until some kind of authority figure comes in. You know, they get in trouble with the law or something of that nature. And then they're forced to take a look at, well, maybe as an adult, I can control my emotions. That's part of the hallmarks of being an, an adult is you can control your emotions. You know, little kids, two-year-olds, they can't, which is why we say an adult who's acting like that, they're acting like a two-year-old. They're not controlling themselves. Yeah. But we do have the ability to control ourselves. You know, there's a very small percentage of people that have some genetic, genetic things that are going on, but that's not what we're talking about. The average human being, if they choose to, they can control themselves, uh, but they just have to practice doing that. Yeah, that's a pet peeve of mine when people condone other people's behavior like that and just say, oh, that's just how Tom is. That's just yeah. how Tom he he's always been that way or whatever and it's like that doesn't make it right no and and it's and that may be true that that person's always been that way of course the uh one of the drawbacks of being that way is nobody wants to be around you well <laughs> so, yeah true so your, your relationships tend to be not very good and oftentimes then that increases the need to be in control and have power which is what anger is all about it's all about anger it's all about power and control and of course, in some situations, that's important. In some societies, you know, that's that's the hallmark of the society. Fortunately, in our little corner of the world, uh, you know, we have the freedom not to, to have to exert that control and power as you would have to maybe in another culture. Yeah, again, it's a control thing. That is something that you can control. It's yeah. a, um. So when you were talking about worry, how can a person stop worrying so much or what can they do to manage their worry? Well, there's basically three things you do. Number one, uh, you know, what are the odds of this thing happening to me or whatever it is that I'm worrying about? Uh, and the problem there is people do what's called emotional reasoning, which means it feels like it's likely to happen. Therefore, it's likely to happen. It must be true. To go back to like people with panic disorder, uh, a lot of times they'll have the fear that I'm going to pass out. And so I would say, so what are the odds that you'll pass out when you're in the grocery store? Oh, maybe 50, 60%. And so then I'll say, so how often have you passed out when you've gone out? Well, I've never passed out. <laughs> okay. So based on reality, the odds are very low. Based on emotional reasoning, the odds are high. And so that's one of the things you got to look at is looking at, at reality what are the odds as opposed to what I feel like it might be. And again, this is where if you're involved in the news media and, you know, these sensational stories and podcasts and networks and things, um, you'll tend to feel like it's very likely when in actuality it's not. So first step is what are the odds? Second step is how bad would it be? So to go back to the lady, uh, you know, fear of passing out, well, it would be the worst thing in the world. I can't think of anything worse than passing out in the grocery store. Okay, so that would be the same as losing your child or having your arm cut off or something of that nature. No, 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 that wouldn't be that bad. Okay. <laughs> so, so on my scale of 1 to 10, it's no longer a 10. It comes back down to, you know, something at a low level. In fact, given that you'll probably be aware that you're getting woozy and you can sit down, there'll be no harm to you, and the worst consequence is you might be a little embarrassed. Well, you can handle embarrassment, right? So the odds are low, the likelihood is, or the consequences are low. So then the next step is, okay, what can I do to prevent it? Is there anything I can do to prevent it? And uh, then also, what could I do if it actually were to happen? And this is the thing where, depending upon what the person was afraid of, you come up with some concrete steps. So, so to use the passing out example, well, I could sit down, and if I did pass out, I could, I, you know, it's only going to be for a minute or two, and then I'll come back, my CO2 levels will readjust and all that stuff. 
So then I could just tell people, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I just, you know, I've been a little bit under the weather lately. You don't, don't need to call the doctor or anything. Just give me a minute. I'll get my stuff together and I'll go on back home. Yeah. And then you take all that thinking and you compress it into one or two sentences. And so you have what we call a, a rational self-talk, a cognitive response that you can, a rational response that you can use whenever that fear comes up. So the fear comes up, oh, what if I pass out? Wait a minute. I know that I've never passed out. The odds are low. There's really not that big a deal. If I do pass out, uh, I've got some plan in hand how to prevent it and how to deal with it. And then you change your thinking to something else. You find something else to focus on. And, that's, and if you look at people who deal with uh, what if thinking or worries well, that's kind of how they naturally have learned, usually by modeling after their parents. Uh, you just assess how likely. Uh, you kind of decide, here's some things I could do to prevent. Here's some things I could do if it were to happen. And then they move their thinking someplace else. They don't dwell on it. Mm -hmm. People who worry get stuck in the first two parts. Oh, it's going to happen. It's going to be the worst thing in the world. Oh, I know it's going to happen. It's going to be the worst thing in the world. Oh, my God, I don't know if that thing's going to happen. Oh, I don't know how I'm going to be able to take care of it. You know, and so they just circle at those two levels. They never move on to the next couple steps. Is that when a panic attack happens, Lee, then? Well, it, it can. I mean, some mm -hmm. people just stay in that worry cycle. <laughs> uh, panic attacks are interesting because uh, usually uh, you're dealing with a person who has a very reactive nervous system. Uh, everybody has you know they, they vary all traits vary some people are tall some people are short there's an average height some people have very reactive nervous system some people don't you got to kind of slap them upside the head to get them to notice something mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you're dealing with somebody and i use the analogy it's kind of like a the house where the wiring's not quite up to code and if you plug too many things in the circuit breakers trip oh yeah that's a good analogy and so with these folks, uh, I'll ask them, so tell me a little bit about what happened when you first had a panic attack. And they'll give me a story like, well, you know, I was working full time. I was going to school. Uh, you know, my dad got sick. I had to care for him. I don't understand why I had a panic attack. You know, so you say, back, <laughs> back up the truck here. I think, I think I figured it out. So what they had was a stress reaction. And they didn't recognize it as, as such because oftentimes they're very competent people. Oftentimes they're out of touch with their body and they just keep pushing through. And so finally their body said, you know, enough already. And they had this stress reaction. They did not identify it as such. And so now they start worrying about, oh my gosh, what happened to me then? What if it happens again? What if I can't control it next time? And then so they get all these what if thoughts uh, going on in their head. And pretty soon they start self-generating them. And it becomes what we call a conditioned response reaction just thinking about going someplace where they got anxious now will cause them to get anxious and start to self-generate and then start doing the negative self-talk and they start to self-generate that anxiety attack and so you can unwind all that stuff it takes a little bit of time but uh, that's one of the reasons i liked working with it is people get better and they learn how to control it <laughs> right right yeah. so in the moment because i've been with people before where they have actually just started to freak out about something <laughs> what what do you do in that moment is it bre breath work are you um what's the best way to cope with it right in that moment well th there's a variety of tools uh number one certainly controlling your breathing and you know, using the military thing where you you know breathe in through your nose then out through your mouth you know and do that in a slow slow way that helps to slow down your your breathing because when you overbreathe, you get uh, too much CO2 in your system, and that mm -hmm. causes a whole bunch of cascade effects in your your nervous system. So breathing helps. Uh, uh, I, I usually would teach people relaxation response. So if they could, uh, and I would get it at what's called cue control. So as they would do their relaxation exercise, they would put their thumb and fingers together so that when they go out in the environment, they could put their thumb and fingers together and help to trigger that relaxation response. You know, with practice, that gets pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then also coping self-statements. Those typically you have to have beforehand. And that's some of the stuff we were talking about with, uh, you know, it's just a panic attack. You know, it's just adrenaline. You know, I'm not dying. It's not I'm the okay. end of the world. It's yeah. not the end of the world. You know, that type of self-talk, you know. And then distraction becomes really important, too. Finding something else to focus on. So that's kind of your, your Band-Aid stuff for managing it. You know, the deeper stuff then comes with your personality stuff but those those four tools work pretty well the uh 
the breathing, the relaxation response, coping self statements, and the distraction, you know, finding something else to focus on. So I, no one is born with anxiety. It is something that they learn as they go on in life or learn from their parents. Well, you, you're born with different types of genetic uh, abilities in your body, right? Some people mm -hmm. just have a more higher, you know, they're more high strung, right? And some yeah. people are, are more easy going. Now, there is a positive side to having these this reactive uh, nervous system. It makes you more intuitive. Uh, you read people better. It's often the thing about you that your friends and your your mate likes best about you because you can really tune into them and notice things and empathize. Uh, the downside is you just get overloaded more easily. And it gets to another theme with emotions is that emotions are just messages, messages that you have some business to take care of uh, <laughs> about, you know, about needs or wants. And like with people with anxiety disorders, one of the things that they have to learn is that if they start getting anxious, they got to go through the uh, the checklist. Well, how's my primary relationship? How are my kids doing? How's work doing? How are my life goals? Um, and usually as you would do that, they would say, well, this happened, but it wasn't a big deal. Well, wait a minute. Your emotional response is telling me it was a big deal. You need to address it. Because oftentimes, you know, relationship issues, you know, boundary issues are a very common thing that will come up. And there's something going on that they're not dealing with. And they're just saying, well, it's not that important. It's not that big a deal. But the emotion that it's generating is selling, telling you that it is a big deal. You know, it's, it's a, there's a need inside of you that you need to take care of. And so you need to set some boundaries or whatever it has to, whatever is causing that issue to come up. And that's true with all emotions. They're just messages about uh, needs or wants. And uh, pay attention to them and, you know, deal with them right here and now. With anxiety, the blessing is that you have to keep short accounts. <laughs> Otherwise, it escalates. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you have a reactive body, when you're when you're getting a little squirrely, you got some free floating anxiety, you know, going on that type of stuff. At that stage, before it gets out of hand, you need to go through that checklist and say, "So, what's going on? You know, how's my relationship? Oh, do you know this? My my, my partner did this that really bugged me, and I didn't say anything. Well, maybe I need to speak up about that. Or you know, how, what's going on with my kids? With you know, kids, this is going on. Maybe I need to deal with that. Or work, this is going on. Or my friendships, you know, my life goals. You know, I'm feeling stuck, like I'm not doing what I need to be doing. So there's something in your life that is pushing that emotion. So identify it and deal with it. So interesting. Um, so do you feel like it's best to like self-treat as far as like start maybe start meditating or, um, you know, working it on your own? Or do you think therapy is like where people should really begin? Well, it all depends how, how, how much it's impacting your life. I mean, if, if you're can't get out the door, then probably talk to a therapist, right? Yeah. Uh, if you're just having a lot of free-flowing anxiety, you know, a book, like one of my books, uh, would probably uh, get you on the right track. Uh, again, it's, it's a spectrum. You know, how bad, because anxiety is normal. Everybody has an, is anxious from one time or another. Everybody gets angry from one time or another and, and so forth. Uh, it's just how much is it interfering with your life? And if it's at a low level of interference, then probably, a, you know, a book, talks, therapy, a group or whatever, you know, podcasts, those types of things uh, can be very beneficial. If it's very debilitating, then, yeah, maybe you need to escalate and, uh, you know, get some help with somebody who's a professional who understands how to deal with those things. Mm. I'm glad that you said anxiety is normal because I feel like people feel like there's something wrong with them if they have anxiety. At least people I know, you know, mm -hmm. they talk about it like it's like they have cancer, you know, just like, uh, I just, I have anxiety. It's really bad. And I don't know if it's getting any better, you know? And so it's good for people to have hope and know that everybody has it. Well, and that's the message. If somebody's saying that, then yeah, probably they need to address what's going on with them, either through some kind of, you know, book, video cast or, you know, actual therapy. You know, one of the most rewarding things for me is I, I had uh, back when I was doing the uh, uh, anxiety disorder uh, conferences and stuff, uh, I had a, a number of self-help groups that were using uh, my anxiety books. And uh, one year, uh, this group from Virginia came in, and they all had these pins that said, so I'm anxious. <laughs> 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 and there's this, this thing that I, that, that I think of is you have to normalize yourself. Okay, I get upset. And I, I'm, I'm the life of the party, but I also get I'm a little bit emotional. That's who I am, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, it's, I'm okay with that. And, you know, I've learned how to, you know, 
not take it to the nth degree, you know, but yeah, I, I tend to be a little bit more reactive person than somebody else. So, and I'm okay with that. And that's true for so many different things that people have. People would come into my office and I'd say, so why are you here? Well, I've got panic disorder, I'm codependent, and, you know, they go on and on and on, all these labels. And so I'd say, so what does that mean? And they couldn't tell me. <laughs> they, you know, people become their labels. And so at some point in time, you just have to kind of say, well, this is just who I am. And um, you, you figure out a way to, to, to deal with it that's going to be use, you know, be okay for you and help you to be functional in the world and achieve your goals. And, uh, yeah, because... A lot of different ways of being in the world. Don't have to. Right. There's no ideal way of being. Right. Yeah. There's no perfect. That's one of the fun things about living in Japan for two years is you you see a culture that's very different from ours, and uh, you know it works. Yeah, I thought that was so interesting to be somewhere with a different culture like that. I've always just lived in the states, yeah. so that would be really neat. Yeah, it's that's one of the things I, I encouraged uh, our kids. I know my daughter when she wanted to get her master's, I said. Go outside the U.S. Get it someplace else. So she she went to England and got it up in York and got involved with the international community and and that was a real eye opener for her. You know, we live here in the states and we believe that that this is the only way that there is to live and do things. And there's a whole other world out there. Oh, hundred percent. So you have written multiple books, but you're one that's about to come out. What what's the title of that one? Well, the, the new one is uh, Why You Feel the Way You Do. Uh, and then I just had two of my my anxiety, phobias, and panic, uh, taking charge, conquering fear, and the anger, taming the beast. Those just got released on Audible as audio audio, audio versions. So, okay. Uh, we all have these core response patterns that we grew up with, and some of them are positive, and some of them are negative. So negative ones would be things like uh, the world is dangerous. You know, I can't succeed. Uh, conflict is dangerous. You know, and if you have that core response pattern, that's something that will really cripple you in life until you change it. And of course, positive response patterns. Each, each negative one has an opposite positive. You know, I can, I can accomplish things if I work at it. Uh, you know, success is possible. You know, I can handle, um, I can ha handle conflict effectively. You know, th those types of positive core beliefs uh, you can have as well. So it's a lot about positive self-talk. Well, yeah. And again, these are all, all just kind of a, re a response pattern that we developed as we grew up in whatever family and environment we grew up in. So if you grew up in a uh, violent family, uh, there's different ways you could go. You could either mirror that and become a violent kid, or you could become a passive kid and learn to just, uh, you know, avoid conflict, Right. And so then that becomes your core response pattern is I avoid conflict. And now as an adult, you know, something goes on and instead of speaking up, I shut up. And then later on, I say, why didn't I speak up? I don't understand. What's well, because you have that core response pattern of avoiding conflict. Wow. That is so interesting because it makes a lot of sense for people mm -hmm. that grow up with multiple siblings, yeah. all living under the same roof, the same yeah. parents, or, or, you know, maybe not, but yeah. the parents aren't together or whatever. Yeah. And they all handle their situations in life different as they get older. Yeah, another really common one is a, a person growing up in a household uh, where there was no closeness. Maybe the mom was just absent, like like I've uh, dealt with people like where their uh, parent was uh, depressed, you know, single parent depressed mom, so didn't have time for the kid. You know, she was just in the other room depressed uh, or maybe drug addict or whatever or busy at work, and so the kid grows up and every time they try to get close to the parent, you know the parent distances themselves, right? So you get this connection between pain and intimacy, right? So intimacy is painful would be the core response. So you learn that whenever your need for intimacy comes up, you back off. Now you fast forward, now they're an adult, they're getting into an intimate relationship, and as things get close, they create distance. And of course, they come in and they say, I don't understand. Every time I start to get close to somebody, you know, I seem to do something that messes it up. And it's because at that unconscious level, the bells and whistles are going off. You know, this is dangerous. You're going to get hurt. Intimacy is dangerous. So back off. And uh, identifying those types of core responses and, and changing them, you know, is a lot of what I did. Wow, that's so interesting. I just mm -hmm. love that stuff. People's behavior and yeah. why they do the things they do. It's fascinating. Well, I might have to have you back so you can talk about your anger issues. 
<laughs> your anger books. Wait, you, you talk to my wife about my anger issues. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I just think it's all fascinating. And just like you said, emotions in general, just knowing yeah. that you, was it hard for you to write the books? Because that to me seems like a daunting task. No, it's, it's, you know, it's, for me, it's kind of mechanical, you know, you, you, you do your research and, and of course the first book I, I was so involved within my private practice, it was just a matter of taking and organizing stuff. Yeah. I, had done, I had done a, a mail order program early on for panic disorder and I decided just to take all that material and stick it in book form and make, just so people could just buy it on the bookshelf and, uh, yeah. So, and, and the anger book, same thing. You know, you do research. You kind of look at what's out there. Uh, you find out what the current research is on the topic. And same thing with this book. I, I spent a couple months just digging into the research. For, you know, what's what's what has affective uh, neuroscience discovered about emotions, and then I combine that with the other things that I knew about. Because I start off with that, then I talk about uh, you know some of those core responses, then talk about the positive psychology, which for me it was still kind of new because it's only about 20 years old that they've been out researching what they call the science of happiness so hmm. so do what's your opinion on medication because i know i've had relatives that have been on medication and one would say they felt numb with it so they didn't like being medicated they would rather just not be on it at all and other ones who have thrived with being on meds because of it well you know when i first started i was kind of anti-medication but then over time i realize that medication can play a very important role uh the key is is has it been prescribed carefully and is it being monitored because what happens with medication is a lot of times it's passed out there's not been a careful evaluation it's not being monitored and so it's being used inappropriately um for example oh add uh, i had a gal came in i remember one time and she was adult add and uh couldn't read a chapter of a book, you know, and I recognized right on, right right away, this this, this is an ADHD lady, right? So yeah. Says, why, why don't you go get an evaluation from, you know, a person who specializes in adult ADD? And I gave her a recommendation and uh, she got on some, some medication and she came in a couple weeks later and said, yes, yeah, the first time in my life I've been able to read a whole chapter of a book. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. And so there, there was a nice pairing of, you know, medication and her condition. And, you know, I knew that the lady who had prescribed it was going to monitor it well so that she was not over medicated and wasn't having any negative reactions. So, yeah. So if it's if it, there's a careful diagnosis and it's getting the result that you want and it's being monitored well, then, um, yeah, I've got no problem with medication. It's, it's kind of like saying, uh, OK, why are you dependent upon glasses? You shouldn't need glasses. Well, the glasses <laughs> is helping me seem better. Yeah, right. Better, then, yeah, yeah, fine. You know, so if the medication is doing what it's supposed to be doing, then, you know, I'm fine yeah. with it. Only somebody with 2020 vision would say that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember listening to a podcast of one that you were on as a guest, and you said that that's how you made friends when you were a kid, was going around and helping people. And oh, that yeah. just touched me. I was just like, what a sweet thing to say. So it's got to be such a rewarding job for you that you can actually see improvement and help people to have a better life. Yeah, I'm, I'm very service oriented. So that's kind of my personality. Well, it's a gift. Yeah, I got a call from a lady uh, actually just yesterday. Uh, I worked with her shoot 20 years ago and uh, she was housebound. So I, we went out driving, you know, that type of stuff and did some field work with her and she was telling me how she'd just written her first uh, musical and she was going to a mall and she, there was no way she would go into a mall back when I was working with her. And she wow. was like, we were filming some, filming some of it in the mall and she sent me some of the recordings and stuff and just, it's, that type of stuff is very rewarding. That's huge. Mm -hmm. That really is amazing. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time so much. Can you promote yourself real quick? I know we said a couple of your books and I'll put it all in the show notes too, but if there's anything else you want out there. Well, the easiest way to find all my stuff is whyemotions.com. So W-H-Y, whyemotions.com. And that's my website. And I have links to my YouTube videos and links to my books. I got some relaxation response MP3s you can download. In fact, I, I've got a surgery prep and a uh, pregnancy prep one that worked pretty good. Uh, oh. With my wife, uh, we used that uh, idea of, of Q-controlled relaxation. So we did a relaxation tape for her. And I have the suggestion, if I touch your knee or your shoulder, I say the word relax, you'll relax. And uh, I remember during pregnancy, the uh, 
gynecologist was saying, does this stuff work? I said, yeah, watch this. So, you know, big contraction. I just touched the knee, you know, relax, dear. And, uh, you know, she's totally relaxed at first. So it speeds things up, you know. Makes it more comfortable. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for all you do. Thank you for being on my podcast. I appreciate it so much. Like I said, I might reach out and have you on again. You're very well spoken and, and uh, good at dumbing it down, you know, for so lay people can understand that it's not hopeless. Well, you know, and that's that's one of the things that I've always thought I did have a, a talent for is I'm, I'm not necessarily creative, but I can take a lot of stuff and I can synthesize it. And that's part of being a teacher a whole bunch. <laughs> oh, sure. You bet. That yeah. makes sense. Full circle. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Renaud. I appreciate it so much. And um, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Uh, it's right. just been, been a delight. All right. Thanks so much. We'll talk later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yo. Yo.